And how old were you when you decided to eventually go into medicine? Well, I decided to go to medical school a couple of times. <laughs> the first time I decided not to do it, and then uh, a year later, it was only a year later, I was 22, when uh, after... So after, it was only slightly deferred. But many people yeah. go into science, uh, oh. make the decision when they're very young. I think it was... In fact, do a lot sure. of their serious work before they're even 22 years old. I think life is uh, different at that at that transition stage of leaving college and thinking about your career at this point. And people say, you know, 30 is what 20 used to be, and... Uh, I um, see a lot of uh, young people who are interested in science and medicine spending a few years off either working in laboratories or doing something entirely different. And it was actually unusual in my medical school class that uh, there were a few of us who had spent one or two or three years doing other things. Most people had stayed in a pretty narrow track, but we're talking about the, the early 60s when life wasn't on, early, on a fast track. My parents were, uh, I think, a little... Um, I'm not quite sure what the right word is here, but they, um, while they accepted the idea when I was in high school that I might become a doctor, when they saw me veer off into another track aiming toward uh, literature and, and career as a teacher, they took a certain amount of pride. My, you know, their, their friends and relatives thought you know, that, that, that the correct destiny for someone of my background was to be a doctor, when, and they liked defending my position. So they were sort of shocked when I decided that I was going to go to medical school after all. But then you didn't become a GP. You well, got into experimental science. That's true. And unfortunately, uh, my parents didn't see all that much of that. They, they saw me veer off uh, at the NIH um, uh, when I was there um, to fulfill some obligatory military requirement during the Vietnam War. Um, but I only became really deeply committed to science uh, in my early 30s, and unfortunately my parents um, had severe illnesses and died about that time. I went to medical school thinking I was interested in psychiatry and putting my literature background together with an interest in, in taking care of patients, and then I found that uh, I didn't have the temperament to sit in a, in a room with a with a psychotic patient and, and do very well at that, and so the, the, the consequence You didn't want to was, hear all the kvetching? Well, it wasn't kvetching. It was just, I just felt I couldn't handle this very well. I wasn't really equipped to do it, and I res have great respect for people who can. Um, and then along the way through medical school, and especially once I reached the NIH, uh, I began to learn that uh, the disease was understandable in molecular terms, and that I found very exciting. And that, you know, my, my indoctrination in the past in lab at the NIH was a rough one because uh, I had intended to go to the NIH to work on some disease, endocrinology or, or, or um, immunology or cancer, and I was thrust into a lab environment that had originally one time been uh, the study of the thyroid gland, and suddenly Ira saw the power of using bacteria as models for gene regulation and control by hormones. That opened me up not just to modern thinking about biological science, but also to the power of using simple models to ask really big questions. That was transforming for me. The kinds of approaches I took um, as a scientist in a group in San Francisco were very similar to the kinds of molecular approaches we took to a problem in bacteria. Uh, again, we were working with a simple model, a, a chicken virus that, that causes cancer, uh, to try to understand bigger things about cancer. Uh, I had moved into cancer research because I really wanted to be connected even while I was doing basic work with something that was obviously disease-related. It just seemed to use, make better use of my background as a physician. You were working on retroviruses. Yes, well, which everyone now, a term that people do recognize because, 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 HIV, of AIDS. because of HIV, which mm -hmm. was, of course, not known at that point. And cancer, we know, arises from normal cells. Our cells have tens of thousands of genes. And the only way it seemed to me and to others possible to begin to understand what was wrong at a molecular or genetic level in a cancer cell was to use some simple tool. And that tool was presented to us through retroviruses and a couple of other classes of viruses that have only a few genes and yet have the power to make a normal cell into a cancer cell. We were just trying to ask a fundamental question. What did that gene do? Where did it come from? And the discovery for which we were, la were later... Um, uh, you never went at the same year. Pardon me? You never win the Nobel the same year. It's no, no. usually 10 years later or well, so. Well, that, that's right. And in, that, in this case, I think people had to understand that the discovery we made, which was that the gene that the virus uses to cause a cancer is a gene that is uh, 
uh, derived from a normal version of the same gene. And that gave rise to a new way of thinking about cancer. And it wasn't until um, many other examples had been, had been discovered and it was clear that the class of genes we had discovered actually play a role in human cancer, not through viruses most commonly, most often through mutations that can arise in a variety of ways that change the behavior of a, of a normal cell, make it behave cancerous.